Well, um, this week when I was asking the Lord, okay, Lord, what do you want me to present this Sunday? And I was praying, and I felt like the Lord gave me two words. And those words were, follow ground. And I thought, okay, well, that's, I think I know where that's headed. And um, so I started to look up some scriptures, and um, I stumbled upon an old sermon that was presented by uh, an evangelist from many years ago. His name is um, Charles or uh, Finley. What's his first name? I forgot. Charles. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, it was a very powerful message. And I just want to let you know that I'm not I'm not plagiarizing. I'm not stealing it, but I am borrowing some of his outline. Because it was so powerful, it was like I, I couldn't improve upon that. The Lord gave this to him. And um, so I'm going to present this. And it's, it's something that we all need to hear. So I'm going to start out with just one verse. It's going to be my key verse today. And it's found in Hosea, chapter 10 and verse 12. And I'm sure you know where I'm going. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until He comes to rain righteousness on you. Now, you notice the key word here is follow ground. But who does He say to break it up? He's going to or He wants us to break up the follow ground. Why? Because it's time. It's time to seek the Lord. The book of Ecclesiastes Solomon tells us there's a time and a purpose for everything under heaven. And the times that we're living in, I feel the call for the church is to examine our, ourselves, examine our walk. You know, this follow ground that the Lord's referring to, He's not saying, you farmers, I want you to go out and get a rotor tiller and dig up your ground. And that's not what He's referring to. He's using that as an example because the Jewish people were mostly into agriculture and some livestock, but they knew what it was like to have fallow ground. And when ground is fallow, it means it was at one time it was tilled and it was very fertile. But for some reason it has gotten hard and it was now unsuitable, unusable. And it needs to be broken up and made soft again so it's ready to receive seed. Because if you put seed on fallow ground, it just lays on the top. And it won't go into the soil. It won't germinate. No matter how much rain or sunlight it gets, it won't take root. Now, obviously, this is an example of our hearts, our lives, that he's talking to tell us to, that we are the ones to break this up. Because if we want a heart that is not follow, we basically have to examine our hearts. So today is a day of just doing self-examination. And everything I'm saying to you, I'm saying to myself. I'm not picking on anybody. I just feel like the Lord's given me this message for me. And I'm supposed to share it with you. Because next week I'm going to talk about how to have a revival. Everybody said, oh, we need revival in the church. Yeah, we do. But how do you have a revival? You can't have a revival until you do step one, and that is to break up the fallow ground. Now, most people don't want to examine themselves, even Christians. You know, we don't want to pay attention to our own hearts and our own walk with the Lord because I'm, I'm great. Everything's okay between me and God. But what we want to do is, instead of ex inspecting our fruit, it's so much easier to inspect the fruit of others and see what they're doing. Oh, I'm glad I'm not as bad as her, or I'm not as bad as him. But self-examination is what we need if we're going to make sure that our hearts are not foul. And that, can, that consists of just looking at our lives, looking at the fruit that we're bearing. You know that scripture that Paul says, um, 
that God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that also shall he reap. I preached a sermon a long time ago that if you don't like what you're growing, check what you've been sowing. You've never once seen a farmer take a watermelon seed and plant it in the ground and grow corn on the cob. Whatever you plant, that's what you're going to grow. And you look at your life and you don't like what you're growing in your life, well then what are you sowing? So now is the time, and I'm, I'm not, this isn't a time to beat the sheep, and I'm not trying to make anyone feel condemned or guilty, because there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit doesn't condemn us. He convicts us, and He tells us, come on, let's do better. So with that spirit, I'm examining my heart, and I challenge you to examine yours at the same way, at the same time. Now, what makes a heart grow fallow or hard? Well, I'm going to list you ten things. Charles Finney had a whole bunch of them. I'm just taking a few here, and I'm, of course, adding my own words, my own insights into this, but there's ten things that can cause someone who's red hot on fire for Jesus, sold out 100%, but even their hearts can get fallow. They can get hard. Well, what would cause that? The first thing is ingratitude or unthankfulness. You know, we need to just sit back and look at our lives and just remember some of the great blessings that God has given us. And, and favors that he's shown to us, and we never said thank you. Remember the, the um, ten lepers came, and they were all healed by Jesus, and they all said, oh, hallelujah, and they walked away and started to live a new life, but only one came back to say thank you. And Jesus noticed that. He says, were not ten healed? Where's the other nine? He notices things like that. And what happens when we don't give thanks for just imagine some incredible times that God has protected us. You know, we're in such a hurry, there's maybe a reason why God doesn't want you to, like me, every morning i got to get an M59 and go as fast as I can and try to get down to Updike Road and get to work as fast as I can. There's some times that I'm driving and I see an accident off the side of the road. Maybe if I was driving like I wished I could have, that accident might have been me. I remember one time, you know those quarter car washes? And you put so much in and you go and you pull in these stalls. Well, I didn't have enough change, so I had to go to the dollar changer. And I put my dollar in there and I'm counting my quarters and I dropped one. And I was kind of in a hurry because I had a lot to do that day. It was a Saturday. I had a big long list I wanted to do. And I dropped some quarters on the ground and I was mad. And I went to pick them up and then I'm just like, oh, come on. Man, Lord help me, i got to get this stuff done. And as I was bending down to pick them up, the stall right next to me, a car went zooming right through there. He decided not to get his car washed, and he zoomed right through. Now, if I wouldn't have dropped those quarters, and I was walking, I would have been right exactly in that spot, and I would have got creamed. How many times do things like that happen? We don't even recognize it. But instead... We want to gripe and complain about the things we don't have or the things didn't work out the way we wanted to. There's some events that if they turned out exactly the way we wanted, if God answered all our prayers, you know what? Our life wouldn't turn out as good as it has. There's a saying, and I know it sounds corny, but it couldn't be more true. Count your blessings. Count your blessings because when you start thinking about, yeah, you know, I do have this. And, and yeah, God has given me this. And you appreciate what you have, your heart changes. When, but when you start griping and complaining, well, this didn't happen, and I don't have that, and why did this happen? Your heart starts to get hard. And a farmer, he may love his field, and he wants to grow the best rutabagas he can grow. But if he puts his rutabaga seeds down on fallow ground, you know what happens? They just lay there. And the birds of the field come and eat them, just like the sower of the seed. But if that ground is tilled, and it's fertile, and it's flipped over, and, and it receives that seed, God wants to bless His people. It's not that He's stingy. He's a good God. But sometimes if He poured blessings on us, we couldn't even receive it. And if we did, 
we wouldn't even appreciate it. And all of that is partly because of the next thing that causes our hearts to get hard, and it's simply envy. You know, we live in a world that this world is always bringing in our face trying to get us to compare ourselves with other people. I'm just learning how to get into the Facebook world because I'm trying to, you know, sell my book and get the word out that, hey, I have a book. And I've noticed something with Facebook. Everybody, when you look at their Facebook page, man, they're just doing great. They got, you know, vacation pictures, and they're smiling, and they're doing this, and oh yeah, and then we went and had dinner here, and oh, we, we met all these famous people, and all these great things. Nobody ever puts on Facebook, me and my wife got in a fight because I didn't want to take the garbage out. <laughs> Nobody ever puts on Facebook, I had to change three dirty diapers today. <laughs> Everybody just wants to give this impression that, oh, my life is so magnificent, it's so wonderful, I go to such exotic and exciting places, and we all have bits and pieces of that in our life, but our lives are geared today for competitiveness. When, like, you know, you're standing in line at Myers, you're just trying to pay for your ding dongs and your Twinkies, and you're just waiting your line, your your space in line, and you look and you see all these magazines, and the magazine screams, "Hey, look, you're not successful because you don't look as good as she does. You're not as handsome as he is." You don't have a car like him. You don't have six houses. You thought you were happy? You're a loser. You're not important. And this constant spirit of comparison causes envy. And, you know, well, yeah, I got a house, but it's not as big as John Travolta's house. Well, I wouldn't change lives with John Travolta for all the money in the world. But that magazine's trying to make me think I'm not as important or I'm not special, or I'm not as successful. When I think about, when I was 17 years old, I lived in my car. Try that for a whole summer. And that ain't easy. And I ate whatever I could find or steal. And I used to take showers whenever a friend's parents were gone. I'd sneak in there and take a shower. Try that for a while. So if you come to my house, it's not the Taj Mahal. But it's a nice house. And it's the nicest thing I've ever owned, and I'm thankful for it. I'm grateful for it. And a spirit of envy, because what happens, even in the spirit world, or let's say the Christian world, some people, Jesus said this, He gives some ten talents, some five, and some one. And there's some ten talent people out there that you've known Christian leaders like this, or speakers like this, they go somewhere and if they burp, 20 people show up and they want to hear about it. Other people can work their fingers to the bone and pray and cry and moan and fast and three people show up and say, oh yeah, so what? This isn't exciting. But where's the heart of each person? And some people God uses more than others. And it's very easy to say, oh wow, how come God doesn't love me? He's, my ministry isn't as big as His. You can't think that way. Because envy will lead you into ingratefulness and unthankfulness. You know what? God does not make mistakes. And you are the only you in existence. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of advice. If you compare yourself to other people, you will never be happy. Now it's very easy to walk down the street and see the guy living on the street and say, wow, I'm sure I'm glad I'm not as bad as him. We never compare ourselves to them. But we always compare ourselves. Everything okay? Okay. <laughs> Missy just wanted to join the service, that's all. <laughs> but we always want to compare ourselves to those who are doing so much better and say, well, how come I don't have this? And how come I don't look as good as that? You know what? If you compare yourself to other people, you will never be happy because there's always going to be someone who's smarter, richer, prettier, handsomer. It's not a good word, but it's the truth. Than you. So don't even play that game. God made you, you. And you're the only you in existence. Nobody can ever compete with you. No one can ever be like you. 
I remember I told you this before, when I first got saved, I used to like, um, well, I liked a lot of kind of music, but I liked Bob Dylan, okay, kind of folky music, and I started writing songs like that. And I said, Lord, you know, now that I'm saved, why don't you make me a Christian Bob Dylan? <laughs> I thought, man, that would be great. You know, I'll tell everyone about you. Bob Dylan, he's just talking about everybody must get stoned. I don't, everybody must get saved. Come on, Lord, use me. Make me a Christian Bob Dylan. And one day I just felt like the Lord said, you know what? I think I'm going to make you a Christian Dave Michael. Because you're the only you. I'm the only me. And if you compare yourself, well, look at, look at their car compared to mine. Look at their stuff compared to mine. If you play that game, it leads right into ingratitude. It leads right into unthankfulness. And you'll never be happy. And what will happen is your heart's going to start to get hard. Because, well, I thought God loved me. How come He, he gives them that and me, I just get this? And what happens is your heart starts to get hard. The next thing, and it seems pretty uh, obvious, but still, we need to be reminded. Something that will harden our heart is the neglect of your Bible. The Bible says, the entrance of God's Word bringeth forth life. So does that mean the absence of God's Word taketh away life? You know, if we're not in God's Word, it's no wonder we feel like we don't have any direction in our life. And it's no wonder that we feel like our relationship is a million miles away from the Lord. Because we need to hear His voice. Jesus said, My sheep hear My voice, and a stranger they will not follow. If you're not listening to Jesus' voice, you're going to be listening to somebody's. And it won't lead you to life. We need to be in His Word. You know, when you have a relationship with somebody, you want to have a conversation with them. And I've always heard it said that listening is the most important part of any conversation. Because when I talk to somebody, I know everything I know. When I talk to you, I don't know everything you know. And when I just, God gave me two ears and one mouth. And if I talk half as much as I listen, I'll learn something. Maybe learn something that will help me, or learn something about you so I can be a better friend. And then just imagine talking to God. Who do you think knows more, you or God? <laughs> So why would I spend all my time talking to him? Well, how come I don't have this? And why don't you give me this? And I want... Why don't you just... Sorry. Why don't you just shut up and listen? And he will talk to us. I've told you this story before, but again, it bears repeating. There is a man who one time he said, Lord, I've heard of all these other Christians that have seen visions of you or heard your voice. I want to see you. And I'm going to go on a fast. And I am not eating until you appear to me. And he fasted. And he fasted. He was like into his third week. And he's really getting kind of weak and tired. And he says one night he's just he's kneeling next to his bed and he's got his Bible laid out on the bed. And he says, Lord, why won't you just show me yourself? I love you. I just want to see you. And he just felt, he didn't hear an audible voice. He didn't see a vision. But you know how when you know that you know that still small voice is speaking to your spirit? And Jesus said to him, He pointed, pointed him, directed him to his Bible, and he says, There I am, look all you want. <coughs> you know, visions and dreams are wonderful, and I love them. But they're not reliable. You can't hang your hat on them. Some dreams are just because you had a bad taco before you went to bed that night. But some are dreams from God. But you can't hang your hat on them. I've had some dreams and some visions that when I get up the next day or after the vision's over, I'd swear to you it came right out of heaven. But after some time goes by and I hold it up to the scrutiny of God's Word, I realize that wasn't from God. But God's Word will never lead you astray. From Genesis to Malachi, from Matthew to Revelation, that's a parameter that is safe as long as you're inside there, 
you will never go astray, ever. So, the neglect of God's Word will make your heart get harder. And the next thing just joins right in that, and that's a lack of prayer. You know, I, I remember, um, at, I've heard it said that during the Azusa Street Revival, there was a prophecy given that said, in the last days, my people will be a people that spend more time praising me, praising a God they no longer pray to. Because we all love praise and worship. It's so exciting, titillates the flesh. You get your Holy Ghost goosebumps. You can jump around, oh, hallelujah, it's so wonderful. And I'm not knocking praise. I love praise. But the praise of God we no longer talk to, that would be like if I said, Baba, she's the greatest wife that ever lived. I love that woman, man. She's magnificent. She cooks really good. Man, she can clean the house. She washes my clothes. She's always there for me. She's the greatest wife in the world. But then when I go home and it's just me and her, I never talk to her. How do you think she would feel? How do you think God would feel? If, oh, I love you, Lord. Oh, you're beautiful. You're magnificent. Oh, hallelujah. And then as soon as you walk out the door, you don't talk to him for the whole rest of the week. We need to pray. Because how can you have a relationship with somebody you don't talk to? You know, people get discouraged about praying. They say, well, I pray, but God never gives me what I want. He never answers my prayers. And again, I preached a sermon about this a long time ago. I beg to differ. Because God answers every single prayer immediately. But sometimes we don't like the answer. The answer to every prayer is either no, we don't like that answer, or it's grow, take some time, I'm changing you, I'm conforming you into the image of my son. Or it's slow, take it easy, I'm doing something that you don't know about. Or it's go. We like the ones that say go. You know, I hate patience, you know that. When God gives me a vision, I want to just tear the roof off the place, let's get going. But no, sometimes it's slow. But God always answers our prayer. I've heard it said that if you read your Bible and you don't pray, you'll dry up. If you pray and you don't read your Bible, you'll blow up. But if you read your Bible and you pray, you'll grow up. Amen. How do you keep your heart soft? God's Word says that when a man or a woman opens that book and reads it, it's like someone looking at their image in a mirror. And that book reflects to me who I am, how well I'm doing with the Lord. And we need to keep our hearts broken, tender, softened, and always willing to receive whatever He's got to share with us. The next thing that will harden the heart of anybody, oh, not me, I'm too spiritual for that. Well, guess what? You're the next target then, if that's what you think. Is unbelief or lack of trust. When we doubt His promises, and we don't believe or expect to receive the blessings that He's clearly promised to us, we're telling everyone, or telling ourselves, or basically saying to the Lord, we think you're a liar. When we don't trust Him. You know, when you're a little kid, if you were raised in a decent family, you never get up in the morning wondering if you're going to have clothes to wear, you're going to have food to eat, or a house to live in. Because you just trust your mom and dad are going to take care of you. I didn't have that luxury as a kid, but most people do. And it's the same thing with my Heavenly Father. When I start to doubt, am I going to be okay next week? What about next year? Am I going to make it five years from now? And we start to doubt Him, we take all His promises in His Word and we just say, I don't believe them. Oh, our favorite one, oh, that's for somebody else. But my Bible says, King David said, I was once young and I am now old. I've never once seen the righteous forsaken or God's seed begging bread. Well, I'm one of His children as much as anybody else. So if He's going to take care of them, He's going to take care of me. Yeah, but I don't see it. Well, it doesn't matter what you see. God has never asked us to rely on what we hear, see, smell, taste, or feel. Because when we do, we're living in the natural. And sometimes in the natural, my bank account says, I'm not going to make it very long. But I'm serving a God of the supernatural. 
And there's nothing that he can't do. And he told me he was going to take care of me and Baba until the day I die. He said it. I believe it. That settles it. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like. But when I start to distrust him, you know what happens? How can you love somebody you don't trust? And when you're saying, yeah, God, I really think you're a great God, and yeah, you've done a lot of good things, and someday you're going to get me into your heaven, but while I'm here down on earth, I don't know if I can trust you. How can I have warm, fuzzy feelings with a God like that if I don't trust Him? We have to trust Him. You know why? Because He's trustworthy. One of my favorite scriptures, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful and He's just. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what's right? So we got to guard our hearts against unfaithfulness. Now, here's another one. A lack of love for souls. Ask yourself this question. And I'm asking myself this question. I'm not picking on you. I'm I'm in the same boat you are. When was the last time I thought about the wretched condition of my relatives, my neighbors, my fellow workers, or friends that don't know Jesus? Sometimes we just forget, or it's not that important. Or what we talked about earlier today. When was the last time it grieved you about innocent babies being torn to shreds in their mother's womb? We sometimes... We just say, well, I, I'm so busy, i got other things to do. And we, we lose this love for souls. You know, Peter tells us that God wishes that none would perish. No, not one. Not even one. That's what God's heart is. You know, I, I keep hearing all the time that um, in the church nowadays, and especially around the world when I talk to other missionaries, you're not supposed to call yourself a Christian. Because it has a bad connotation, especially in other parts of the world. You call, you, you call yourself a Jesus follower. Okay? So if I'm going to be a Jesus follower, you know what Jesus said? He said, follow me and I'll make you rich. Is that what he said? That's what Kenneth Hagin said. Jesus told him when he showed up, follow me and I'll make you rich. No, Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you famous. Is that what he said? Follow me and I'll give you everything you ever wanted. No, that sounds like what Satan offered Jesus in the wilderness. Just bow down and worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. No, what did Jesus say? Follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Amen. Because that's the heartbeat of God. Other souls. Now, rightfully so, what has happened, those of us that have shared our faith, those of us that have reached out and tried to minister to other people, if you've done it for any length of time, you know what happens is sometimes you'll get punched in the nose. You'll get a door slammed in your face. Or you'll even get stabbed in the back. And after that happens for a while, you know what? Guess what? Your heart starts to get hardened. And you get to a point where you, you almost want to say, well then go to hell. I don't care if you're not going to listen to me. And that's dangerous, dangerous territory. We can't do that. We've got to keep our hearts tender towards other people. I've talked about before in Hebrew, a lot of times when the word mercy is mentioned, in the Hebrew, the definition of that word is with skin on. You know the old saying, never judge a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes? Well, we need to be with skin on. We need to understand what that person's going through. I can't tell you how many times there's been people in my life that when I first meet them, they're very unattractive emotionally or repulsive. But when you get to know them and you talk to them and you ask questions, you find out what's happened to them in their life to get them to that point, And your heart starts to go out to them. And you, and you start to feel a tenderness for them. It's very hard to be angry or hate somebody that you're praying for. But we got to have that tenderness towards souls. And I'm going to go on a little rabbit trail here in the same venue. What we need to do as Christians, and this is very important, 
is we need to have a love for the body of Christ, for our other brothers and sisters. And it's the hardest thing to do, and it's been amazing to me how hard it is for Christians. We just need to learn to get along. Now, I've told you this many times before, you see our church, we're not a big mega church, and if everybody that came to this church would have stayed, we'd be over 200 people. But I've never, and I'm just being honest with you, I've never had anybody come and tell me they're leaving the church because they thought I was a heretic or because I was preaching inaccurately. But almost every single person has left. Well, some have left because other churches have more bells and whistles. And fine, hallelujah, if that's what you feel God's calling you to. But most of the people have left because of interpersonal you know, squabbles and fights. And people just can't get along with each other. Think about this. When you talk to a fellow brother or sister in the Lord, and let's say in our church in particular, just stop for a minute and just think about, what if somebody talked to me that same tone of voice and that same way, how would I respond? We're all part of the same body of Christ. If we can't get along with each other, what's that say about Christianity? We're going to live together forever in God's kingdom. We get to practice down here. And so many times there's, there's struggles and there's power challenges and people, I want to do this and I want to, you know, everybody wants to rise to the top of ministry and get their name in lights and who cares? Who cares? If, you know, John, the Apostle John says, how can I say I love God that I can't see if I hate my brother who I can see? So, the loss of love for souls, the loss, and even within the body of Christ, when your heart gets hard and you've been hurt in churches, I hear, meet people all the time that have been hurt in churches. It's not when that happens, but or if it happens, but when it happens. Just go to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I've been hurt. Would you please heal me? And Jesus says, come unto me if you're weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, even unto your souls. But we got to keep that tenderness towards other people, the lost and the saved, or else the only thing that's going to happen after that is our heart will get hard, and we have a fallow heart, fallow ground. The next one, and I'm moving along, I promise. The love of things and possessions. There's an old saying, who owns your possessions? Do your possessions possess you, or do you possess your possessions? When the state of my heart concerning my earthly possessions is to the point where they're mine, and they're more important to me, and they start to own me, the, the carts in front of the horse. Because do we look at these things as if we own them and they belong to me? Let me ask you a question. When you came to the planet Earth, how much did you own? Zippo. Let me ask you a question. When you leave the planet Earth, how much you taken with you? Zippo. So all this stuff is just a bunch of stuff that we get to play with for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 years. It's just stuff. And there's nothing wrong with having nice things. We want to have nice things. But do those nice things own us? Or do we own them? You know, there's, there's some people that God's called them to a certain thing and they say, well, I can't, Lord, because i got to paint the garage. Oh, I can't, Lord. I gotta cut the lawn. Oh, I can't, Lord. I gotta go get. I gotta get this fixed, or I gotta do that. And I've heard people say, "Well, I'm a Christian. I need to be the best example in the whole neighborhood." But you know what? It's nice to have nice things, and I'm not putting that down. We all want nice things. But what people need is not to see a beautiful house. They need to see a beautiful soul that loves them and gonna welcome them into God's kingdom. And there's the man, the rich young ruler. Now, Jesus isn't against money. You know, he said, make friends with yourself with a mammon of unrighteousness. But this young, rich, young ruler, his possessions possessed him. 
And he came to Jesus. Oh, great Master. Oh, good Master. You know, trying to get all this attention. And Jesus looked at him. You know, Jesus doesn't fool around. He goes right to the heart. He says, give away everything you own. Right. He goes, give away everything? Do you know how much I own? And he couldn't do it. Let me ask you a question. And I'm asking myself the same question. What if Jesus appeared to you physically and audibly right when you go home tonight, He's right in your room and you know that you know it's Him. And He says to you, I want you to give away everything you own and come and follow Me. Would you do it? My, my Aunt Maud's knick-knack collection? I'm supposed to give that away? Yeah. Now, I can honestly tell you, I'm easy to give things away because, you know, I would give up everything and follow Him in a second. I've done it a number of times. That's never been a problem for me, my possessions possessing me. I guess because when I was a little kid and I got kicked out of the house when I was eight years old, I had nothing with me, and I've never felt secure with owning things. I've always liked to be travel light and be ready to leave anytime I could because I didn't have that security of a, a house where I could keep all my knickknacks. But do your possessions possess you? Because if they do, you're going to protect your stuff. I love you, Jesus. I'll do anything for you, but don't touch my stuff. I worked hard to get this stuff. I shine it up. I paint it. I wax it. I put a light on it. And put it up here in the, on the, my favorite shelf up here. Don't. I love you, but don't touch my stuff. <coughs> we got to remember, we're just pilgrims passing through. That's all we are. And you know what? God wants. He created us to want more. That's good because it motivates us to keep moving in life. But always make sure your heart's in check. Is this stuff working for me or am I working for this stuff? Because remember, someday when we leave this world, we're joint heirs with Christ. Amen. And everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you. And He's got some really cool stuff. And you get to own it as much as He does. So He's not saying, I want you to do without forever. He's just saying, the stuff that I bring across your path, enjoy it. Be grateful for it. But don't ever let it get into your heart because where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. He says, just enjoy it. But remember, you may have to lay it down. But one day when you leave this planet Earth, wait till you see what I got waiting for you. Because I have not seen nor ear heard nor entered in the heart of any man the things that He's got for those that love Him. Alright, I'm almost done. Another thing that will cause a hardened heart is vanity or spiritual pride. In the morning, on Sunday morning, do we spend more time worrying about how we're going to dress our bodies when we go to church than we do preparing our hearts to be in the ministry and the worship of God? Man looks on the outward. God looks on the heart. That's what Samuel told us. And it's only natural. I, I want you to look as nice as you can. I, got, I don't have much to work with, but I try to look the best I can. But that's okay. But what about the heart? Now, this, this vanity and spiritual pride, do we try to impress other people with how spiritual we are? Because, you know, Jesus used the word hypocrite a lot. And that word hypocrite in the Greek means like an actor who puts on a face in a play. And when we get together, we all put on our, our Jesus Christian face. Hallelujah! Glory to God! Everything's wonderful in my life. You know, it's just me and Jesus all the way. But when we go home, we take our plastic face off and hang it up and just say, Woe is me. How am I going to make it through another week? Jesus is just looking for us to be honest and to be real. That's all He cares about. Right. What's in the heart? Not what's on the outside. And, you know... Spiritual pride is, it, it stinks in the nostrils of God. Because you know what it is? Where it originated? There's this created being, his name is Lucifer. And he was gorgeous, intelligent, magnificent. You know, parts of his body are instruments. When he breathes in and out, he will exude music. 
And his job was to take all the praise and worship of the entire created universe and present it into the throne room of God. And one day he said, I like this. I'd like some of that praise and worship to come my way. And because of that pride, I mean the five eyes, I will ascend to the sides of the north. I will be like the Most High God. I, 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 I. That spiritual pride is what caused all this mess that we're living in today. And anything that even sm smells like that, God hates. You know, the, the most intelligent man who ever lived, according to God, Solomon, wrote in the book of Proverbs, he said there's six things that God hates. No, seven are an abomination. I learned a long time ago, stay away from the abominations. Because God will abomination over an abomination. So stay away from those. But he gives a list of six things and then God impresses on him. No, add another one. And you know what the thing he added at the top of the list? A proud look. Now, you may say, well, what's that got to me, do with me? I'm a Christian. So many times... I've seen ministers and ministries that God starts to use them and it starts to kind of go to their head. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I'm above that. Maybe if I would have been one of those that just said, hey, we're opening a church and 10,000 people flocked in, I might be susceptible to saying, wow, I guess I'm really a great preacher. Look at all these people that came. I don't have that, so I don't have to worry about it. That spiritual pride, but some people do. And I've seen it go to their head, and you've seen them too. Very famous, well uh, grounded ministries have gone astray because that went to their head. I mean, we look at it in the, in the secular world musicians, movie stars, they're always having award shows to pat each other on the back. Here's an Emmy, here's an Oscar, here's a, you know, all these other awards, and they get worship. And people get posters of them and hang them up on their bedroom. <coughs> and they get worshipped. God will share anything with any of us except for one thing, His glory. Because we weren't designed for that. Amen. Because it goes in and it gets into your spirit like it did with Lucifer and it can destroy you. So, spiritual pride, you got to guard your heart. Many of you remember um, J. Vernon McGee? Get on the Bible bus. I remember him saying once he was talking to a young preacher, and he says, now I want you to remember something in your life when you start preaching, because you're going to hear a lot of people criticize you and praise you and give you all their opinions. He says, just remember this, nobody's that good and nobody's that bad. Amen. So you just do your best right. what God has given you and let him take care of it. Don't be a man pleaser, be a God pleaser. But spiritual pride is what's got this whole mess that we're in because Lucifer just said, hey, I want to be like that. <coughs> Two more to go, and I'm almost done. This one is a bad crippler. This one will harden your heart like anything else. Bitterness bitterness. Just ask yourself when you're alone with God, just say, Lord, is there somebody in my life, in my past that I'm holding a grudge against? Somebody that I just can't forgive? Because bitterness will make your heart hard. You know, when somebody gives their life to Jesus, what the Holy Spirit does, He does a lot of things. He seals us. He adopts us. Um, but one of the things he does is he sprinkles seeds in the garden of our heart. And these are called the seeds of the fruit of the Spirit. And fruit has to grow. It has to have fertile ground. You have to pull the weeds out. You have to water it with the water of the Word. You have to get the sun, S-O-N, sunlight in your life for the fruits of the Spirit to grow. But your joy, love, peace, temperance, all these things, they grow in your life. But there's something else that will grow in our life. Remember Jesus told the parable about the wheat and the tares? And somebody came in unaware and planted some tares. And the tares grew with the wheat to the point where Jesus said, I can't pull the tares out because it will hurt the wheat. So i got to let them grow together. But the devil will come and he'll put in our hearts this thing called the root of bitterness. 
And if you let that grow, it brings ugly fruit. Man, does that fruit stink. It looks ugly. It tastes rotten. And it bears ugly, ugly fruit. And it all comes from bitterness. Paul said if we don't forgive, the devil can plant that root of bitterness and it will harden your heart. Amen. You know, I've, I've visited many people in psychiatric wards and I, I, I would say every single time that person was there because something bad had happened to them and they just can't get over it. Now some people have had bad things to them and they have every right to be mad and every right to be hurt. You know the old saying, hurt me once, shame on you. Hurt me twice, shame on me. God wants us to learn. When somebody hurts you, learn from that. And if somebody's trying to do the same thing, you say, nope, we're not falling for that again. He doesn't want us to be a doormat for anybody. But He also doesn't want us to walk around with a grudge because that grudge is seeds of bitterness. And that bitterness has the root that will grow ugly fruit and it will do you more harm than the person you're mad at. Especially, it really ticks you off when you're mad at somebody and then you come across them and they're doing great and they're happy and they're enjoying life and you're all tied up in a knot and then you get even more angry at them. Now, rightfully so, bad things happen to good people. But the thing is not to try to get... You know, I heard the best revenge is success. The, over, the best way to overcome evil is with good. Right. So bitterness will kill you. And it will harden your heart. And just go to Jesus again. Say, Jesus, I've been hurt. This person hurts me. Well, He never asked you to be a doormat for anybody. If that person hurts you, just say, no thank you, I don't need that anymore. I told you the story about the man who, very wise man in this village, all the world, the, all the word went out all around his world that this man was very intelligent and he would come into this village once a week and he'd sit down and he would talk and people would ask him questions and he'd just give him great words of wisdom. But one day this one guy, he didn't like that. He was mad. What do you listen to that guy for? What does he know? So he says, I'll show you all. He's a fake. So the next time that guy came into town, he's sitting there and people are asking him questions but this one guy starts heckling him and putting them down, calling them names. Ah, you're a bum. You're a liar. You don't know what you're talking about. Just trying to do everything he can to attack the guy. But the wise man just smiled, just kept on going, answering the, all the other people. And this guy, he finally just can't take any more. He says, what's the matter with you? Are you deaf? Can't you hear what I'm saying to you? And the wise man looked at him and he says, sir, let me ask you a question. If somebody gives you, offers you a gift, and you refuse it, to whom does that gift belong? He says, well, I guess the one that offered it. He says, okay. Well, all day long you've been offering me insults and put-downs, but I refuse them, so they belong to you. And the man got even more angry and went away. There's a lot of abuse out there. If you want to be a doormat, there's people out there that will take advantage of you, and that's up to you. But Jesus never asked anyone to be a doormat. He said if someone punches you or slaps you on the one side, offer the other cheek. But depending how you want to look at your anatomy, I only got four cheeks. And I ain't going to let no one get me a fifth time. He put a brain in my head. So, go to Jesus. Ask Him to forgive you for this bitterness. Me forgive, ask for forgiveness. Do you know what they did to me? Yeah. What they did to you was one thing, but how you responded to it is another thing. Ask God to forgive you how you're responding to all that abuse and say, no thank you, I don't want any more abuse, but please forgive me and heal me. And then the last thing that can cause a heart to go fallow. And you're going to say, well how could that be? We're Christians. But we're being honest here. A lack of love for God. What? I'm a Christian. I love God. Okay. I pray you do. But let's be honest. When you're all alone, it's just you and you. Ask yourself this question. Is there anything you're angry at God about? God, why did you allow this to happen in my life? Why did you put this person in my life? Why didn't you let this happen? Why do you bless them but you won't bless me? And all these thousands of questions. 
and we blame God for it. We hear people all the time that when they were young, they prayed and a loved one died of cancer or something and they get so angry. You, uh, those of you that saw the movie God's Not Dead, remember the college professor? He became an atheist because he prayed for his mom who was dying of cancer and he prayed and he prayed and prayed and she died anyhow, so now he's mad at God. So he says there is no God. And so many times that happens, even to Christians. And being angry with God, how can you be open and tender to somebody that you're secretly angry with? When our heart gets cold towards God, it then starts to get warm towards something else. And when God calls Himself a jealous God, and we give our heart to other loves, other things, it, in, it just incredibly offends Him because He loves us. When you love something else, it's idolatry. It doesn't matter who or what it is. Some people idolize other people. Some people idolize things or positions or power or fame. That's why the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods before Me. If you're angry with God, you know what? The truth shall set you free, Jesus Amen. said. You get alone with God and say, God, I'm going to tell you something. I'm really ticked off at you. Now don't worry, you won't offend him. He's got pretty big shoulders. And he already knows you're mad at him. He just wants you to be honest. And just get alone and say, God, why did you let this happen? Or why didn't you do that? Or why is my life in this situation? And get mad at him. He said, come, let us reason together. He, he made us rational human beings because he wants to have conversations with us. And he knows what's going on in our hearts. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have two tubes sitting there, one's got preparation H and one's got toothpaste, and you say, hmm, I wonder which one I'm going to brush my teeth with. Oh. <laughs> you can make a big mistake there. <laughs> but you apply a little pressure to each of those tubes, and what's inside comes out. So what God does sometimes is He allows pressure to come to our life so it applies pressure to us, and what's in my heart comes bleh. Have you ever been in a situation where you're just frustrated or mad, and all of a sudden you say something, you go, wow, where'd that come from? Because it was hiding in my heart. God knew it. He wanted me to know it. So God's saying, come, let us reason together. You're mad at me? I'm big enough to handle it. Come on, I know you're mad at me. Why don't you just admit it? And we got to remember... His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. He's a great, magnificent, awesome, genius, colossal God that's doing something in each one of our lives. And we say, well, why? And He says, I ain't going to tell you. I learned a long time ago when you're in a bad situation, you can waste your time asking why, and very rarely are you given an answer. What you do is you ask what. All right, now that I'm in this situation, what do you want me to do? And say, Lord, I'll be honest with you. I have a really bad attitude about this. And I'll be honest with you, Lord. I'm not, I'm not your biggest fan right now because you're blessing them and you're blessing her and him. And, but look at me, what i got to go through. I'm not real happy about it. And he says, I know. I'm glad you told me because now we can deal with it. But I trust you anyhow. Even though I don't understand it, and I'm not going to ask why, because Paul says we see through a glass darkly. But someday we will see face to face and we will know even as we are known. And just think of how you're known. Every hair on your head is numbered. Every tear you've ever cried, he's caught in a bottle and numbered them all. He knows your DNA strand because he put it in your body. That's how well he knows you and someday you're going to know him that well. But in the meantime, just be honest. Because the truth will set you free. So, when somebody asked Jesus, it was uh, Simon the Pharisee, he went to his house. <coughs> and he says, you know, he's thinking he's going to catch Jesus in some kind of little trick or something and make him look bad. Well, you can't. You can't make Jesus look bad. He knows everything. He created everything. But Simon the Pharisee went up to him and he said, Okay, Rabbi. What's the greatest of all the commandments? 
And Jesus looked at him and he says, Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. And the second commandment is likened unto it. Love your neighbor even as you love yourself. For on these two hang all the law and the prophets. we got to love God. How can you have a heart that's open to God to receive His blessings and His instruction and His vision and His guidance if our heart is hard because we don't like Him or we're mad at Him or we don't trust Him? It can't happen. So, I was praying like I always do, Lord, how do you want me to end the service? And this is what He told me to do. I want you all to close your eyes. And be alone with God. Now this list of ten things, did anything strike a chord? Did the Holy Spirit put His finger on anything that I said today? Now remember, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So if you're feeling condemned, that's not God. Rebuke it. But if you're feeling a conviction that says, you know that's you, let's deal with it. I want your heart to be open towards me. Remember what he told Hosea? It's time for us to break up that fallow ground. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play that song, Hear Our Cry. I don't want the praise team to come up. I want you to be alone with God. I'm going to play this song, and anybody who felt like the Lord spoke to you on any of these ten areas, I want you to just come up here and just be alone with Him. And get it taken care of. And open your heart. Because, I'll be honest with you, I don't know all I'm going to say next week, but I know the topic of my sermon is how to have a revival. Because we all want one. We all need one. But this is the foundation. we got to make sure our hearts are ready to receive what God wants to do in our lives. So, whosoever will, the altar is open. And don't be ashamed. Don't worry about what other people think. In reality, everybody should be up here.
Heavenly Father, we come to You in the name of our Lord Jesus and in the mercy of Your Holy Spirit. Lord, for each one of us, those that have come forward and those that haven't, we're all, if we're honest with You, Lord, we all need to examine our hearts. Because this world is hard, it's tough, and it does things to us. And we respond sometimes not in godly Christian ways. And it just wears on us. And it makes our hearts get hard. And we pray and we cry and we try and we do so many things for you and your kingdom and it doesn't seem to work out. And we get angry, we get discouraged, and our hearts get hard. But Holy Spirit, we're doing, the, we're doing the obedient thing. We're coming forward and saying, help us. Holy Spirit, you be that plow, that rototiller that comes and breaks up that fallow ground and make our ground fertile and moist and ready to receive what you, the living God, wants to pour into our lives and how you want to use us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for being such a a merciful, long-suffering God. Lord, I pray for each person here. Lord, let them receive exactly what you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.